Good morning. It's good to see you all here today, and uh, I'm glad to be back in our home church. Uh, thank you for giving me uh, some time off, and I was uh, able to spend that with family over in Washington and spend it with my two grandchildren that I have, Andrew, who is uh, five now, and uh, Emery, who's now around five months, approaching five months, and uh, we had a great time with them. Um, I want to uh, say this to the men of our congregation. Uh, we heard about the men's movie Wednesday evening. Uh, I want to really encourage you to come out, gentlemen. Uh, and if you have teenage sons or sons that are, you feel that would be uh, old enough to understand the content of a, of a PG movie, um, then please bring them, bring them along. If you have a friend, uh, invite a friend. Uh, I think this is a powerful movie that will speak to us. I believe it's timely. It's needed for this day and age. And uh, I hope to see you there. Um, we have been going through the Sermon on the Mount. And this is our final sermon on the Sermon on the Mount. At least for this time. At least for this time. And we are in Matthew chapter 7. If you want to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 7, and uh, we're in the final verses of chapter 7, starting with verse 24. Um, I'm, as I'm talking, I'm multitasking, if that's possible for a male to do. Um, I'm kind of praying and asking wisdom of my Father in heaven, because uh, I had planned to do something a little different today, and I don't know... Uh, if we're going to have time to do that. So I think we're going to maybe do it in an alternative way, uh, not the way that I had planned it, but in an alternative way. So if you would, please turn to Matthew chapter 7, if you have your Bibles. We're going to begin with verse 24. And as we're reading this, I want you to look for some similarities and some differences. Similarities and differences. And uh, maybe if I could have, uh, I think I'm going to try to do this. We'll see how we do in the beginning. We may have to uh, do it differently as the sermon goes along. But I need a couple of volunteers that would be willing to take the mics around for me. Maybe I've got some young people. Oh, i got one young person there, yeah. And uh, yeah, right there. Send her over. Come on. Come on, Lily. Come on. Okay. So Sierra has the gray mic and Lily has the black mic. Okay. So you can just have a seat for right now, girls. You can have a seat right now. Uh, we're going to read again, beginning with verse 24. We're looking for what now? Similarities and differences. Okay. Here we go. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Okay, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to retrieve some answers. Girls, you're going to have to stand up and look around. If you're willing to give a similarity, a similarity in these verses of the two houses. Okay, there we go. There's a hand up over there. Is there another hand over here that Lily can come to? Raise your hand up. Oh, there's one in the back. Okay, so go ahead. They built a house. They built houses. So both of them built houses. He took what I was going to say. But they both heard Jesus' words. Oh, they both heard Jesus' word. 
and they both built houses. Any other similarities? Oh, we've got a hand up here. And we got a hand up here, Lily, right up here. Hold on a second. Lily? Here? Okay, what was it? And the rain came down. It was a big storm because the floods rose and the wind blew. Okay, so both houses were in the storm. Rains came down, winds blew, floods came, right? Okay, now what are the differences? What are the differences? We've got a hand right back here. The rock and the sand. Oh, one house is built on sand and one is built on rock, okay? The one on the sand fell, the one on the rock stayed firm. Okay, the one on the sand fell, the one on the rock stayed firm. Any others? We've got another hand right behind them, Lily, right over here. It comes down to what is your foundation? Oh, okay, okay. What is your foundation? One was wise, one was foolish. Ooh, one was wise and one was foolish. We'll take one more. One did what he heard and the other did not. One was what? One of them, it says whoever hears my words and doeth them, and, and one did not. Oh, so one, did, one, one did heard not. the word and they did it, and the other heard the word and just ignored it. Good. One, one, they're all both made out of the same material, except for one was crushed and one was not. Oh, so the houses may have been built out of the same material, but the foundations were different. Good, 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 good thing. Yeah, good similarities, good differences. And, and we're going to kind of unpack that a little bit as we go along. Turn with me now to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Where are we going? Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. Okay. Galatians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. We're going to start with. Paul says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself as the what? Chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Okay, so here we got another building that's taking place, a building metaphor that we see here, correct? All right, and we start out with verse 19, speaking of where Paul says you are no longer foreigners and aliens. Who are the foreigner and aliens? Do we have a hand that would be willing to talk about that? Who's the foreigner and aliens that Paul is talking about? Got a hand over here. Thank you. In that culture, it was the Gentiles. Yes, it was the Gentiles. In other words, at that point, they weren't considered by the Jews to be part of the chosen people, the kingdom of God. And so they were foreigners, right? They were foreigners, and they were exiles. In fact, in the temple, there was a wall built that even if they became believers, they couldn't go beyond that wall because that was only, that area was reserved for Jews. But as Gentiles, they had to stand with outside on the other side of that wall. But Paul says... Consequently, because of the gospel, because of what God has done, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but your fellow what? Your citizens. Your citizens. You are God's people, member of God's what? Household. So when we think of God's household, right? 
Who's the primary dweller there? God is. God is. God dwells with his people. And, and so God, we see God dwelling here with these people, and it's built on a foundation of the apostles and prophets. Who's the cornerstone? Raise your hand. You gotta raise your hand. Find a hand, Lily. Find a hand someplace. Okay, the cornerstone is Jesus. I don't know if the microphone picked that up. Is it turned off? But I heard him. It was turned off. The cornerstone is Jesus. That's right. The cornerstone is Jesus. What is a cornerstone? What's a cornerstone? Here's a hand right here. Isn't it the main stone that they start with that everything else has to fit? With? Okay. It's the first one. It's the first one. It's, the, it's in the corner, as the name implies, correct? Oh, I've got a hand up here in the back. Wants to comment on that? I beg to differ. The house was built and the cornerstone was added to strengthen the house. If you notice, in that building in those days, they built and the cornerstone was added to strengthen the house. All right, that's, uh, thank you for your opinion on that. I want to I wanna go ahead. My understanding is the cornerstone was the weight where all the weight had to bear. And so it had to withstand the, the uh, storms. It had to, it, it couldn't crack. I mean, so it was, it was so critical um, that uh, when they tried different stones at the temple, they cracked and didn't, you know, they didn't hold the weight until the one that they had rejected and they, they used it. So it, it was had to be very strong and had to withstand a lot of pressure and weight and the elements. Okay. So, might I say this, the cornerstone was the beginning of the foundation. It was the, the, the whole key of, or, or the future success of that structure was based on the laying and of the cornerstone and the makeup of the cornerstone. A cornerstone was the principal stone, usually placed, like I said, in the corner of the building, and it guided the workers within their courses of how they laid the rest of the structure. Um, it was most carefully constructed, or it was uh, carefully constructed in any building. The Bible describes, as we've already said, Jesus as being the cornerstone that his church would be built upon. That's key to this this whole idea, this whole metaphor. So he's the foundational piece of the building. Once the cornerstone was set, it became the basis for determining every measurement in the remaining construction. Everything was aligned to it. And Paul tells us here that Jesus is the chief cornerstone on which all of his people, all of his holy people, are built up and become a what? A temple, and what resides there in the temple? And God's Spirit resides there. They built together, becoming this dwelling in which God dwells in His Spirit. I want to now turn to Isaiah. Let's turn to another text. Isaiah chapter 28. It's in the Old Testament. Isaiah 28. And we're going to look at verses 16 and the first part of 17. Okay, Isaiah 28, verses 16 and 17. Okay, so this is what the sovereign Lord says. Who says this? The sovereign Lord, the God of the universe. See, I lay a stone in Zion, 
What kind of a stone? A tested stone. A precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be what? Dismayed. I will make justice, notice this is very important, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness what? The plumb line. Now a plumb line, for those of you that may not be builders or have never used one, a plumb line is basically a string that has a weight attached at the bottom, a plumb, so to speak. And so you would go, like if we wanted to find out from the rooftop, if we went to the center of the peak and we wanted to find out where on the carpet floor would the center of the peak fall, we could take uh, a scaffolding and build it up there and take the plumb line and put the, the uh, one portion of the line up there at the top peak and let the plumb come down and allow the plumb to stop its movement as we've dropped it down there and where that plumb stops that's the very center point of reference in line with the peak. So we have a measuring, and then we also have a plumbing, correct? According to this text. So, who's the builder? Who's the builder? The sovereign Lord is the builder, right? He's the one who's building. And he takes a stone, and it's a tested stone. Who's the stone? What is this stone? Jesus is the stone. How has he been tested? Through trials? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 33 years here on earth of testing. Okay. He says, though, there is, I want to get a little more specific. See if somebody, if you want to raise your hand, in the verse we find a way, not only through trials, not, but he's tested. He's measured by something. Okay, I got a hand up here. Raise your hand again, nice and high. That stone would have to be perfectly square. Okay. It would have to be perfect in its measurements. Otherwise, the whole building is going to be off. Okay, so it's a perfect stone. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Yes. Wait, 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 wait for the microphone. Lily, come on up here. <laughs> all right, she's got the energy. It's perfect in justice and righteousness. Oh, it's perfect in justice. And righteousness. So I want you to think about this for a moment of how Christ, how was Christ tested in the area of justice and in the area of righteousness? I heard a hand, give her the microphone right here in the front. No, that's you, Diane. <laughs> he kept the law perfectly. Okay, he so he kept the law. the law perfectly. We would call that what? Righteousness. Now he did keep the law perfectly in a sense in justice. What's the justice? What did Christ do that was justice and therefore, I'll give you a hint, justified us. He paid the penalty for our sins. He paid death. Ah, he died. See, he was just. There was justice there because, again, Christ came to this world. He took, took upon himself our sin, our fallen nature, and he took it upon himself. And because he was willing to do that, he came to what? To die. And it was just for him to die. If he had not taken upon himself humanity, God would never allow anyone 
to die for an unjust person. Scripture says the father cannot pay for the sins or the, or the, the son cannot pay sins of the father and the father cannot pay for the sins of the son. Every soul that sins must what? Must, must die. No one could have done what Christ did other than Christ himself. Because as we've learned through our study, for those of you that were with us, our book of Romans, as we went through, when Christ came to earth, he didn't come as an individual. He came as a representative of humanity. He was, as Paul mentions in his book, he is the last Adam or the second Adam. The first Adam subjected us to sin and therefore the penalty. The second Adam came in the likeness of humanity, taking humanity upon himself, right? And therefore, because he did that, he had the human race that was put in him, that's the gift of God in his son, and he died the death. So just as he, the first Adam, affected how many? All. Oh, the second Adam also affects how many? All. All. But the gospel is a gift that must be received, right? Therefore, not all will see glory. But they have the right to glory. But not all will see it. And so he was just, he brought justice, he died the death, and he brought righteousness because not only was he obedient to the law that God had given, he was obedient even to the point of his death. Even though justice was coming and falling upon him and he was dying the death that we deserved, even though he had not sinned, he had willfully taken on our nature and therefore he was righteous in the sense that he was obedient and died the death on the cross. Does this make sense this morning? All right. So he is the precious cornerstone in, upon which this is built. And he, so therefore, he is the measuring line, which is justice, right? And the plumb line, which is he aligns with heaven, is righteousness. If it wasn't for Christ's justice and righteousness, we wouldn't have grace, we wouldn't have anything. Right? The house on the sand would go what? Splat. Splat. Okay, turn with me to another text now. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. Well, we might not have enough time to, but you can turn there if you can get there quickly. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11, it says, For no one can lay a foundation other than the one that is already laid. Which is whom? Jesus Christ. You see, in other words, friends, there's no other hope than Jesus. That's why, as a Christian, if you claim to be a Christian, your only hope is in Jesus, and you can have, therefore, then, assurance of God's love and salvation. Today! Right now! Because your foundation is built on the rock, right? Who's measured out justice and who has plumbed righteousness. There is no other foundation. And who laid that foundation? God himself. It's God's foundation. Think about it. Cain tried to lay another foundation. If you think about it. In a, in a sense, metaphorically. God says, this is what you need to do. Go get a lamb and come and sacrifice the lamb. The lamb, again, signifying what God would do, what God provides. He provides the lamb, and that lamb is Christ. Abel takes the lamb and he slays it, just as God had said. Cain, on the other hand, says, well, I'm going to bring God my foundational trust, what I've put together, what I've worked my fruits, my vegetables. I'll give God my best. God says that foundation will go what? 
flat. Right? But Cain tried. The people of the Tower of Babel. God put a, 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 a rainbow in the sky. Promising that he would never do what? He would never flood the world with water again and destroy it. But they built a tower. Why? Because they were going to build their own foundation. They said, we don't know if we can trust God. We're going to build our own tower. That way, if there is rainwater that comes out, if there is floods, we can be safe because we'll be in our tower. Hmm. Have mercy. God says there's only one foundation that we can build on. The Pharisees, of which, again, during the time of Christ, which this Sermon on the Mount was being presented, was, again, what they were teaching the people of the day was legalistic righteousness. They were going through all the, the ceremonies and, and so forth. Think about it. We're in the season of the first advent. Were they prepared for Christ's coming? Were they teaching that the babe was going to be, you know, was going to be there, was coming? Yeah. When the message came to them that the Christ child was born, did they accept it? No. They were building on their own foundation. But Christ had sent the cornerstone, the cornerstone which some people stumble over. Hmm. I want to read to you a quote from the book called Thought, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. This is from page 150. How do we build this foundation? Maybe you're not a builder. You're like, well, how do I build? This is page 150, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. Do you desire to become a follower of Christ? Yet you know not how to begin. Are you in darkness and know not how to find the light? Follow the light that you have. Set your heart to obey what you do know of the word of God. His power, his very life dwells within his word. As you receive the word in faith, it will give you power to obey. As you give heed to the light you have, greater light will come. You are building upon God's word, and your character will be builded after the similitude of the character of Christ. Christ, the true foundation, is a living stone. His life is imparted to all that are built upon him. Ye also, as living stone, are built upon spiritual houses, 1 Peter 2, 5. Each several building, fitly framed together, groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. That's Ephesians 2, 21. We just read that a moment ago. The stones became one with the foundation. The stones became what? One with the foundation for a common life dwells in them. A common what? Life dwells in them. We'll be finding out in the next couple weeks, again, looking at that common life dwelling in people. We often focus on the gift of eternal life. But that eternal life is an outcome of being connected to the eternal life that was given to us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Notice what she goes on to say. The stones became one with the foundation for a common life dwells in them all. That building no tempest can overthrow. For that which shares the life of God with him surviveth, how much do you think? All. But every building erected on any other foundation than God's word will fall. Now she's going to explain this a little more, so don't, don't drift on me. Listen up. 
But every building erected on other foundation than God's word will fall. He who, like the Jews in Christ's day, builds on the foundation of human ideas and opinions, of forms and ceremonies of man's invention, or on any works that he can do independently of the grace of Christ is erecting his structure on a character upon the shifting sand. The fiercest tempest and temptation will sweep away that sandy foundation and leave his house a wreck on the shores of time. Friends, if our foundation isn't built, if our faith isn't built on Jesus Christ and nothing less than his righteousness, our houses will fall. Our houses will fall. Again, the reason this is important is because in understanding that and if we build upon God's word and take his word and understand the gift of salvation that has been given to us, no matter what tempests come, no matter what winds of strife come, Satan cannot shake our foundation. And we can have assurance. Let me say that again. We can have assurance of salvation today. But I want to take us to another text before we close. James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. Because again, as we looked at our original text, they both heard the word. They both built houses. They both went through the storm. Just because you become a Christian doesn't mean you're going to avoid the storms in life. The storms are going to come. The floods are going to come. James chapter 1, verse 22, beginning with verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they what? And they do. Now, I've got a question for you. What is the law of liberty? Okay. I will agree with that to a point. What is the law of liberty? Who gives us liberty? Christ. Christ himself is the word. Christ himself is the law. He has fulfilled the law. Right? In other words, he hasn't done away with law. He's fulfilled the law in both justice and in righteousness. And what Paul is saying here, or James is saying here, As long as we keep our eyes looking intently into the perfect law that brings liberty, does that mean liberty to sin? No, because God in Christ delivered us from the law of sin and death. We're no longer in bondage to sin. We can choose because of the spirit that now dwells in us to live lives of righteousness. But that doesn't gain us heaven. But that's the result of heaven. Correct? Okay, I want to read you another quote. (laughs) Christian Education. It's a book, Christian Education. 
It's page 57. It's paragraphs 2 and 3. Listen up. The theme of redemption is one that the angels desire to look into. It will be the science and the song of the redeemed throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Meaning, in other words, the science, the study. It will be the study and it will result in the song of the redeemed throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. It is not worth, it is, I'm sorry, is it not worthy of careful thought and study now? What? What is, what is it that needs to be studied? Redemption. The redemption. The infinite love and the mercy of Jesus, the sacrifice made in our behalf, calls for the most serious and solemn reflection. We should dwell upon the character of our dear Redeemer and intercessor. We should meditate upon the mission of him who came to save his people from their sins. And as we thus contemplate heavenly themes, our faith and our love will grow stronger. And our prayers will be more and more acceptable to God because they will be more and more mixed with faith and love. They will be intelligent and fervent. There will be more constant confidence in ourselves. Nope. That's not what it says. There will be more and more constant confidence in Jesus and a, a daily living experience in his power to save to the utmost all that come to God by him. By him. I'm going to close with it, or I'm gonna, one more paragraph there. As we meditate upon the perfections of the Savior, whose perfections? The Savior's, the Redeemer, the study of our science and song. As we med upon the, meditate upon the perfections of the Savior, we shall desire to be wholly transformed and renewed in the image of his purity. You see, we hear the word, but do the word. Do the word in this sense. Put your confidence in your Redeemer. Put your confidence in what he's accomplished. Put your confidence in the fact that he now wants to dwell in you. Put your confidence that you're a new creation in Christ, the redeemed of heaven, that you are a son and daughter of God, and your mind will begin to be transformed in such a way that you will desire, not forced to, because of that salvation that he's given and himself, that presence will transform us to want to be like Christ in his purity. There will be a hungering and a thirsting of soul to become like him who we adore. The more our thoughts are upon Christ, the more we shall speak of him to others and present him to the world. What a powerful statement. <clears throat> Friends, God doesn't want us playing church. It is great to come to this house of worship. It's great to sing songs of praise. It's great to set the Sabbath aside and dwell. But God just doesn't want us for a short period of time. For our foundations to be built on the rock, we need to daily behold him. And by beholding, we become changed into his life. I'm going to close with the verse 
verses 28 and 29 of Matthew chapter 7. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, in other words, when he had finished his sermon, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Christ spoke with the authority of heaven and he spoke life. Friends, let us build our house on the rock and he will give us life and life abundantly. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this time that we have been given and the time that we've taken, Lord, to look at the Sermon on the Mount. May we never forget the lessons that are there. And folk, Father, if these folks are like me, we're going to have to keep going back to that place. And remember that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Father, I pray that during this holiday season as we've come up upon uh, the celebration of the first advent. May we learn the lessons that we find in a stable and in a manger. May we apply them to our lives in knowing that, God, you were willing to come, not to palaces, not to be lauded as a king, but you came as one of the lowest to serve, to seek and save humanity. Lord, I pray that we would stand in awe of you this day and that we would give you glory and honor and praise for the great things you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing song is My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Let's stand with our praise team as we close with that song. benediction, I'd like to remind you that uh, if you'd like to join one of our prayer corners after the service for some additional prayer and praise, uh, please uh, feel free to do that. We'll have a group that will meet up in the corner up by the piano, 
and another one that will be in the back of the room on the side of the organ. Oh, Father God in heaven, once again, we thank you for your righteousness. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the gift of salvation that we have through him. Now, Father, I pray that as we depart and we go into the mission field, I pray, Father God, that we will live our lives as the redeemed. That, Father, we will live our lives without concern in the sense for our future because we know what our future is in Jesus. But I pray, Lord, that we would live to serve others. That, Father, as we enter the mission field, we will take them the good news about Jesus. That we will bring healing to those who desperately need it. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.